So, good morning. My name is Dariusz Kozarawski. I'm Vice Rector for Military Affairs and International Relations in our National Defense University. And I would like to welcome and to uh, present you our distinguished guest. He's a Professor Marcus Kerber. He represents, he is a representative of the Technology University in Berlin. He's a specialist uh, concerning international uh, relations, especially in the aspects of the finance and econ economical issues. And Professor will give us a paper for today in the main uh, subject. Let me give you the free translation. Rule and position Germany in European Union during the global economical crisis time. So, sir, the floor is yours, and have a nice time with our students. Thank you, sir. After the paper session, you will be able to ask professor and to give the questions, and one remark, one question for one person, please. Sir, the floor is yours. Dzień dobry. I'm very pleased to talk to you today, and I'm very happy to see so many young faces here, and I'm happy to see some of the faces I've already seen uh, yesterday. Um, well, the topic, the role of Germany in the global economic crisis, is a topic which is identical about the concept of Germany's role in Europe. And I would like to um, give you an explanation, a critical explanation of the role of Germany, it is, so to speak, an inventory of what has been done so far and what should be the role of Germany uh, in the years ahead of us. And I would be very happy to get from you an impulse, suggestion of how Germany could, in my opinion, better manage the crisis we are um, focusing on. So if we talk about um, crisis, we talk about the instability uh, the inherent structural instability of the euro area. You've heard about the enormous crisis we had in 2007-2009. It was the general financial crisis due to um, the collapse of the Lehman Brothers banks, which um, in a form of contagion created many, many bank collapses and um, made the states uh, or required the states to, uh, to save a number of banks. And then we had from 2010 onwards, further to the Greek crisis, um, many little euro crises in, in smaller euro countries. First Greece, then Ireland, then Portugal. And in the framework, in the course of that crisis, uh, the role of Germany could be observed, or can be observed very well. So I would like to take the euro crisis, which is ongoing, to exemplify the difficulties of, of Germany to find a role and to contribute to European stability. Um, well, I have copied a paper for you, a little article, which was first published in an Italian um, uh, periodical, Limes for Geopolitical Affairs. Uh, the name is The Strategy of Instability. This is a contradiction in itself because there cannot be a strategy of instability. That's why I put strategy into inverted commas. But if you take a look at what Germany actually does, you have a little bit the impression as though Germany thinks that instability and postponing, pursuing instability in economic and monetary firms is part of a strategy. So what actually happens? Let me go back to the fundamentals of the euro crisis. The European Monetary Union is a unique experiment, a unique experiment. It is a monetary union of sovereign states. Nobody, nowhere in the world, a monetary union has been successfully achieved between sovereign states, states who have one single currency but who have no mechanism of how to enter and how to leave the monetary union who have no common economic policy, who have no fiscal compensation mechanism, but who simply promise each other to 
Not to spend too much money, not to exceed a certain deficit, not to be in line with certain stability criteria. So the most important stability criteria, you know them, not spending or not having a deficit more of more than 3% of GDP and not having a tax, um, debt burden of more than 60% of your, of your um, gross national uh, product. So as a matter of fact, the euro was a unique chance for the peripheral, peripheral countries in the south to get very cheap money. From day one, of the European Monetary Union, the spread, that is to say that the, the interest difference between Italy and Germany for state bonds was reduced, which was before 250 basis points, so 2.5%, to 25 basis points, 0.25%, almost nothing. So if you had been a, a rational treasurer, treasurer of your uh, economic affairs, of your financial affairs, you would have used the cheap money in order to restructure your overall tax, man, your overall debt management. The contrary happened. Spending increased in Italy, spending increased in new dimensions in Greece, spending uh, increased as well in Ireland. I don't mention the Spanish case as a special case. And as a matter of fact, we have in all these countries a mixture of banking crisis, um, debt crisis, and all of a sudden, from autumn 2009 to, to spring 2010, the markets discovered that the debt burden of Greece was no longer, as they say, sustainable. A small country like Greece, 11 million inhabitants, had a debt burden of almost 350 um, um, billion uh, euros. Unbearable, unbearable, obviously unbearable. From that moment onwards, uh, the rescue of the eurozone was on the agenda. And from that moment onwards, you can see how Germany behaved in that particular field. Well, let us first of all remind you of the facts. The Greek example is an example of a totally homemade crisis. Nobody was in charge or was, the, the, was responsible for the Greek crisis. The Greek crisis is due to a refusal of the Greek state to raise taxes and to collect them. It is due to uh, a, a, a public spending which is scandalous and it is due to an overspending even in the military sphere. No country in Europe spends more compared to GDP than Greece. And they still claim that they are menaced by Turkey. They have to spend so much money on, on uh, uh, naval armament just for the sake of defending some isles. So there was not one reason to say Greece needs a rescue, or as we say, a bailout. A bailout is to say you give them money in order to prevent them from collapsing. But as even a small country, a small country has a great capacity of what I call to capitalize damage, to create collateral damage. Everybody was anxious that the Greek crisis would fuel a fire everywhere in Europe, that there would be contagion. This is what the, in, the, in the financial jargon is called contagion. So the elites in Brussels, the president of the European Central Bank, came together and said, we are going to save Greece. Germany, throughout the construction of the European Monetary Union, fought for a clear concept of a stability union. No common debt fiscal responsibility of your own debt, no bailout, no bailout by the European community for um, uh, emergency states and no bailout by the other community. So all of a sudden the German Chancellor said, well, we make one exception, we make one exception and they arranged bilateral credits for Greece, bilateral credits for Greece. And that created what I call, 
or what is called in the financial sphere moral hazard. It gives a bad example. And the Greek rescue was not over. That island was knocking at the door and said, well, we have a banking problem and we have only 4, billion in, uh, 4 million inhabitants. Can you help us with something? And a little later on, Portugal came around. You know the follow-up of the story. Then all of a sudden, Spain had severe banking problems. And the last part of the agenda is Cyprus. The Cyprus case is the most ridiculous case. It's a grotesque case because Cyprus is some sort of offshore island for Gazprom. Uh, for Russian oligarchs who want to put their money there. The only island where banks don't ask you where the money comes from, where banks give you great compensation for the money you deposit there, and um, where you don't have to declare income. So Cyprus was an offshore paradise within the European Union. And a good reason to say they're in a crisis, we are going to close it down. But even Cyprus, a tiny entity in the European community, seemed to have a capacity to manage or to blackmail by saying we are going to capitalize our damage potential. Throughout that period, throughout that period, Germany, although Germany has factually a veto power, in all the different instances, in Central Bank, in the European Council, in uh, the European me Stability Mechanism, formally or informally, because we take the biggest share of responsibility, Germany followed. And the following, or what I call the strategy of instability, has turned out to be totally fatal. I will give you a few numbers. Today, after three years of euro crisis, we don't have any stability. The eurozone is more unstable than ever. And those forces who wanted to make it the contrary of what the design was originally laid out for have achieved a substantial renegotiation of the Maastricht Treaty. What once was a central bank being in charge only for monetary policy has become a central bank in charge of buying um, state bonds on the markets and helping um, uh, countries in fiscal emergency. What once was a European monetary union with a no bailout clause uh, has become a, a monetary union where factually you do bailouts. And we have created not only a system of bilateral credits, but we have created a permanent European stability mechanism. That is to say, a mechanism which is fueled by the different member states in order to help those countries in emergency. And there is one very, very simple saying, where there is a pot of money, you find people who want to, to get access to that pot of money. You know this. Uh, this is very human, as long as there are funds, regional funds, structural funds in, in Brussels, everybody wants to get access to these funds, because it's, uh, it's, it's third people money. Well, the German policy from the very beginning was a policy without any strategic goal. This is my first thesis. The strategic goal of Germany throughout the European crisis was, we want to remain Everybody's darling. So the strategic goal was something which you cannot achieve. Because if there's crisis, close to war, you cannot remain everybody darlings. Or you postpone solutions. So Germany preferred to remain a good friend with everybody, but postpone the solution. Greece should have been kicked out of the European Monetary Union. The country deserved it. And the country would be better off today because they would have their own currency, they could devalue it, and they could catch up with um, competitiveness. Because if you cannot devaluate, you have a euro, a currency, which is too expensive. I had very interesting talks yesterday 
in um, uh, the National Bank of Poland, and I advised uh, a member of the um, Council for Monetary Policy not to join the European Monetary Union because the catch-up process of the uh, Polish economy would be hindered. So the first aim of German policy was not to solve problems, but not to be enemy of all nations. And this has to do a lot with the German past. You know the German past. It's a past which is never over, and the German talk more about their past than they talk about the future. And I don't think that future problems can be solved by looking at the past. The past is a remedy to learn, but it's not a remedy to give you a strategy of today. <clears throat> Let me give you a little bit a result of what happened. Well, the first credits, the bilateral credits, which you see here, are relatively unimportant amounts of money. Um, it resulted for Germany in May uh, 2010 in a burden or in a risk exposure of um, uh, roughly uh, 12 billion euros. Okay, you're a little late. <laughs> yeah, but you're welcome nevertheless. Then the IMF intervenes with a considerable package of money. Germany is in there as well, being a shareholder of IMF. Then we create a European financial stability facility with 780 billion euros able to intervene. The German risk, risk exposure is around 226 billion euros. Then we create a European financial stability mechanism by the European community itself. Germany takes a share part of about 12 um, uh, billion euros. Then we create um, what we call SMP, a security market program. This is the intervention of the European Central Bank on the markets to buy assets or to, to buy bonds, state bonds, of those countries who are ailing. Germany is part of ECB with a shareholdership of 27%. There are seats here as well, if you want to. Yeah? The closer you are to me, the better it is. So we have risk from every side. Again, on one hand, we have the bilateral credit. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. We have the bilateral credits with relatively unimportant sums of money um, in May. Then we have the IBM, uh, IMF intervention with the risk exposure of Germany of 50 billion. Then we have the European Financial Stability Facility with 780 billion. Germany's share part, 270, 226 billion. Then we have the European Financial Stability Mechanism. Germany is part of 12 billion, the security market program, and then we get another thing in there, the target program. Have you heard about target? Who of you has already heard about target? Target is a payment system of the European Central Bank by which the different banks, Portugal, Italy, um, Cyprus, uh, don't really pay but they simply compensate the claims they have. So if somebody buys a car in Portugal from Mercedes in, Stutt in Stuttgart in Germany, this is compensated on the level of, of European Central Bank. And the different, the different national central banks have claims against each other. The southern countries buy a lot of products in Germany or from Germany. They don't actually pay, but they have a they give a claim, a credit, they get a credit from Germany through the Deutsche Bundesbank, through the German Central Bank. And the target credits, with now about one trillion, is the claim the Deutsche Bundesbank, the German um, National Central Bank, has against other central banks. Now, take a look at, at this number, one trillion, one trillion. 
more than three times the national budget of a year, is the amount of claims the Deutsche Bundesbank has against national central banks in Italy, in Portugal, in Spain. If these countries go bust, this claim is without any importance. You cannot get the money back. That brings us to the last stage of the dramatic development. And the development I'm talking to you about is the development you will witness. It's, it's as exciting as war, I tell you. As it, it, it is monetary war in a certain sense of the word. As all these instruments have not been sufficient to stabilize the Eurozone, because there is a, a South being non-competitive and a North being competitive, and the spread between these two parts of Montreal Europe goes on, we have created a European stability mechanism. The European stability mechanism is a real cash fund because for the first time, the countries do not only give guarantees, they cash in money. So part of the 700, million, 700 billion uh, available in ES, ESM has been cashed in. And Germany being at 27% part of ESM is risk exposed to roughly 190 billion uh, euros. So we made the sums... We have aggregated all this. We have aggregated this just by putting together the sums of money where Germany is exposed to great risk and what would happen if after Greece, Portugal, Ireland, Cyprus and Spain, other countries will knock at the door to get money from these funds. Let us only suppose Italy the biggest debt portfolio uh, in Europe will ever knock at the door. Then we would have to remanage and restructure a debt portfolio of 2 trillion euros. 2 trillion euros. This is enormous. And this could really trigger off a major world crisis. But the, the funds available at ESM are not able to take over a debt of 2 trillion. It can only take over... 100 or 200 million. So I made the calculation what will happen if ever um, Italy and as well France will have access to these funds. Supposing that they sooner or later will say, why not? Because it's not our money. This is a chance. Uh, wherever you get third people money, this is an irresistible chance to get money therefore. Then Germany would have a risk exposure of roughly 1.8 trillion euros. 1.8 trillion euros means that Germany would, from one day to the other, double its public debt, which is today about 2 trillion euros. If Germany doubles the debt, the debt burden, Germany will no longer be a triple-A debtor. And not no longer being a triple A debtor mean, will mean that Germany will have to pay more interest on the market than before. And that the part of the budget used for um, uh, debt uh, service will immensely increase. So, I think even for somebody who is not an expert on the European Monetary Union, these figures might explain to you, might make it explicit to you, that we have cr not created stability, but we have assumed more risks to create more instability. What is the intelligence of a nation to accept such debt in order to get so little more stability? This is what I call the strategy of instability. The strategy of instability. The strategy of being everybody's darling, of not being, of not being willing to stand up and to say, let's stop the show. We have to bring this to an end. This brings me to the question, 
We can talk about this endlessly if you want to have questions. I can be very specific about this. But as we wanted to talk about Germany's role, I would like now to come to what should have been and what could be Germany's role in the future. That brings me back to the special, to the specific position of Germany geographically and economically here in Europe. Germany is geographically and in the diagram of power the real heart of, of Europe, like it or not. And is, is the central economy. Germany could have said no to any of these measures and this would have meant that either the Eurozone is finished or that you have to modify the Eurozone. So, the specific position of Germany is that we have a natural, a natural and unconditional veto power. If you have veto power, because in all these organisms you have at least 25%, and without you, you they can, simply cannot finance, veto power means that you have to prove responsibility and that you are requested to think and to reason in strategic terms and not only content yourself by saying, let us hope that the Greek crisis will be over in two years. The French president of ECB in 2010 said, this is wonderful, Germany consented. The crisis is over, within two years Greece will make a consolidation program and Greece will be back to the markets. I said in those days, being one of the challenges in the German law courts and in the European law courts of all these mechanisms, this is unrealistic. This is uh, an expression of self-righteousness. Uh, Greece has to do a generation's work. They have to reform their, their state. They have to change the system. Uh, it is the system which has got bust in Greece and it's not just only a debt crisis. Nobody wanted to believe because politicians believe in self-fulfilling prophecy. You know the reality. After two years, Greece is in deeper crisis than, than ever. Greece is far away of having, again, access to capital markets. And there is growing revolt inside of Greece, accusing Germany and others of being responsible for the crisis which was so homemade in, in Greece. <clears throat> so, we are witnessing today not only a crisis of the Eurozone, but a deep crisis of German leadership. Leadership being understood as the willingness, the unconditional willingness, to stop projects that in the long run have no strategic purpose. All these figures show that Germany has taken the enormous risk of becoming insolvent herself. What will we do if the savers, the, the rescuers, can no longer have to be rescued themselves? What will Europe do if Germany is no longer in a position to bail out smaller nations? So, a nation which does not think years ahead and does not think in strategic terms, is a nation without strategy. And this is the inventory I do make of Germany of today. We are a country without strategy. A country which consents to such a Euro rescue mechanism which might lead to the loss of its own solvency is a country gambling with its sovereignty. Well, Germany has been under enormous pressures uh, in the years um, uh, before and uh, the dramatic um, uh, events in Brussels are s a story of I would call what I would call monetary war. But this is not a reason which could, should excuse the instability we, which we have created in the system. So which is going to be the design of Germany's role? Um, some people in Europe say, well, Frau Merkel, the German Chancellor, is like Bismarck. 
And Bismarck for them is the expression of German hegemony. We are far from that. And there is, there is no hegemony because there is no willingness to create hegemony. Uh, apart from that, the German Foreign Office is incapable, intellectually speaking, of creating hegemony. Incapable. Yeah, they are the nucleus of the we are everybody's darling, everybody's darling strategy. So hegemony is neither intended nor wishful or nor a reasonable strategic aim. But the strategic aim can only be stability. And if all these risk rescue measures bring about a discussion in Greece about the Germans being um, dictators in Europe and in France that Germans impose their, their will on Europe, this is not stability, it's instability. So Germany has to think about its, her role and the suggestion I would like to make is that first of all, Germany has to use the veto power to stop projects which are not reasonable and which in the long term create more instability than stability. Secondly, Germany has to accept animosity because a country with that past is very easy to blackmail. And there is one thing uh, I say to you about blackmailing. You should, once you are blackmailed, you will be always blackmailed. So you have to resist blackmailing from the very first instance. And thirdly, Germany must have a, a, a vision of the checks and balances of the different system of powers of all Europe. The European Union is very much a Western-orientated organization. And the people in Paris, well, they know that Warsaw is somebody between Berlin and, 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 and Moscow. But being Brussels-based and Strasbourg-based, the European Union has very much a Western touch. Whereas Germany, by its very nature, is in the heart of Europe and has to think of a system of balance, checks and balances, for a strategic balance all over Europe. This European uh, monetary mechanism and monetary union is... Um, uh, is, is perhaps the, the, the most explosive subject for the time being, which will not only mean if ever it, it, it will not be maintained or contained or uh, stabilized, it might bring about um, collateral economic damage, but it might lead even to political disintegration. Because if there's crisis, if there's instability, you need somebody responsible for that. You need a scapegoat. So, in order to come almost to an end, I would like to give you um, a vision. And this vision comes from a former minister of foreign affairs, a very courageous man, who did something which nobody expected him to do. When Germany was the odd man out after the First World War, he negotiated a separate peace treaty with the Soviet Union of those days. The man is called Walter Rathenau. He was murdered half a year later. He was one of the greatest sons of our people. And his courage remains to be praised. <clears throat> Let me read a few words. In a situation such as the one we are, history demands that a German politician with leadership qualities finds the courage to end the Euro adventure in a coordinated and disciplined way. An orderly withdrawal is known to be the most difficult of military operations. Orderly retreat is the thing which is very difficult to organize. It requires far-sightedness alongside courage to lead born of responsibility, far-sightedness exemplified by our foreign minister Walter Rathenauer requires Germany to rediscover the will to exercise power, to wield power, not just in her own interest, but more pertinently in order to prevent the European catastrophe, economic catastrophe, by steering a course through Brussels' central powers. 
In that particular task, Germany is not alone. However, Finland, the Netherlands, Austria, and why not Poland, will stir as soon as Germany discovers courage on the European stage and finally starts to act. What Walter Rathenau succeeded in doing under incomparably more difficult conditions in the Treaty of Rapallo in 22, rescuing Germany from international subjugation, should also be possible for a long-standing democracy such as Germany is today. If Germany is to acquire strategy, it cannot, it cannot afford to have its foreign policies to those in office in the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs for a second longer. It is, after all, who have, if, if it is they, after all, who have collaborated in Germany's self-afflicted undoing for more than 20 years in the name of Europe. So we have really reached a turning point, and I all congratulate you to see either Germany re-emerging as a political power and trying to turn around the European project, or the European project being more or less dismantled and, 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 and ending in disintegration. And I don't think that this is in the Polish interest. Thank you very much indeed. So, thank you very much, Professor. Now we'll start the question session. As I said, the rule is you will be able to give one question to our guest, sir, you will answer, okay? And so, let me open the session. If you will want to ask, could you give the sign by hand? I will show who will be able to ask and will deliver you microphone, because we will want to listen to you, the all of us. Do you want? <laughs> Don't be shy. Oh, Kennel, please. I'm Colonel Mallet, uh, currently a student of uh, Defense Policy Postgraduate Studies. Uh, sir, taking into account all complexity you mentioned today, both political and economic, um, my question is simple. Do you believe in European Union as a federation uh, resembling United States of Europe? I mean United States of America and uh, the same in Europe. Uh, and uh, because of the fact that I'm allowed to ask only one question, I will refer this question to the yesterday, yesterday presentation because uh, it somehow it refers. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the biggest challenge or problems of security are just in Central and, Europe, and Eastern Europe. Uh, at the same time, you mentioned that the least modern armed forces are in those countries. And uh, my question extended in this case is, uh, don't you think that in this case to uh, balance the chances all of countries taking into account uh, anyway uh, powerful uh, position of Germany, mm -hmm. that there should be some mechanism resembling mechanism in the European Union in, in, in economy area. I mean, funding uh, security expenditures uh, at the basis of a kind of uh, stability mechanism uh, for this purpose. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for this um, very interesting question. Thank you for so attentively uh, listening. Um, shall we solve the crisis by creating the United States of Europe? Um, resembling very much the United States of America. Um, you cannot solve the problems of which are, which are due to the, the lack of sense of belonging by saying you belong all together. If that crisis, that Euro crisis, has proved one thing, that in Europe, between Greece and Germany, between Cyprus and Finland, between Austria and Portugal, there is not a, an absolute and unconditional sense of belonging. The Germans feel, rightly I think, that they are not responsible for the mess in Greece. And uh, the Finnish think that what has been created in Cyprus is not their affair. So whenever you create 
a federation like the United States of America, you need a sense of belonging. That sense of belonging is like a mythos. In the United States, it's the mythos of the mythics of the founding fathers, of the, uh, of the settlers coming in, having a common destiny. In other nations, it's a different one. Europe is characterized by different, very old nation states, which have, where every nation state has a special national consciousness. Here in Poland, the national consciousness is a different one from the one in Germany. And this national consciousness develops differently. So, I don't think that the solution to that crisis is let's make a step further into the United States of Europe because nobody wants the United States of Europe. And I don't see Poland, having been besieged for so many years, giving up her independence, national independence, of becoming just a federal state. Poland is more than Arizona or New Hampshire or Southern Carolina. And the differences between France and uh, Germany are bigger than the differences between uh, Arizona and Texas. That's a matter of fact. And those who say in Brussels, let's have more Europe, they do not respect the feelings of the different nation states. And they know each other very well. They are very fashionable. They are very intelligent. They, they know where to go. But they don't pay tribute to um, what the population thinks. And the population, as we see from the Europe crisis, is far from being ready far from being ready to share the destiny of the other nations. So, come to the second part of your question, your extended question. <laughs> Shall we make an exception from that in matters of defense? Shall we make a an exception from that if it comes to, the, to the survival of one nation and to the defense of one nation? My answer is very clear. Yes, the defense of Europe, by Europe, through Europe, is a European matter. And the more we can get organized in that field on our own, the better our security is, and the better our European sovereignty is. I don't think that missiles deployed on European ground by non-European states is a good idea. It is naturally considered by other countries as a menace, as an intervention. So, my answer is very clear because the defense of borders and the defense of the integrity of national territory is a fundamental matter where uh, the sense of belonging and where the willingness of the nations to step in and to make sacrifices, uh, because what you see are material sacrifices. In that case, in defense matters, you meet human sacrifices. Unnecessary. <clears throat> the legal framework for that, the legal framework for that is still not suitable, because there are two matters in the European treaties, foreign policy and defense matters, which are not community affairs. And we are far away from creating a, um, a European army. But we have to be tricky. We have to be tricky. As we lack everywhere the critical size, and as budgets go down, and as no national army, neither the Polish nor the German, can lead operations on, on their own, we have to come to integration and integrated forces management uh, from, uh, not from above, but from below. We have to work it up from the bottom. So I have trust that the soldiers, because here yeah, the practitioners, will work together to deliver recipes, remedies, ideas to the politicians to come up with a, what I call a more integrated defense approach uh, in Europe. But this is a long way ahead and it takes a long evolution. You cannot order this from one day to, to, to another. And we have 
certain frameworks for that. Enhanced cooperation. One of the fields of enhanced cooperation, I told yesterday, is having a doctrine, a defense doctrine for the Baltic Sea. Yeah, this is the first cornerstone of that. Have I answered your question? So, thank you very much. Uh, could you give the next question, please? Do we have any? Kanal Jabłoński, please. Kanal Jabłoński, Landforce Command. Currently, I am a student of this academy. I have, sir, for you uh, one short question. Uh, what strategy, strategy, strategic role of Russia do you see in the process of, of regaining uh, economic stability in Europe? This is not a simple question. Um, you know, Russia is um, unpredictable, huh? Yeah? Unpredictable. Might be sunny today, might be rainy tomorrow. You never know. This is, you never know what happens there. You don't look behind the curtain. Um, um, fundamentally, I think, uh, and I say this with great esteem for the Russian people, uh, that Russia is part of Europe, uh, culturally. So they had a mishap of about 70 years with, with communism. Well, in some countries it takes 12 years, in other countries it takes 70 years. And they still recover. And they still catch up. So let us give them some time. Because... Um, integration of Russia depends on not only democracy, on rule of law. Rule of law. And so far, Russia is um, in not a very established country with the rule of law, from an internal point of view. Um, secondly, Russia represents enormous economic potentials. Yeah, and these potentials are extremely interesting and they are extremely interesting for Russia so I think although this is disputed in Germany um, the economic ties between Germany and Russia are very helpful to create interdependence some people say in Germany we consume too much Russian gas I say well they sell a lot of gas to Germany um, I know this is a very sensitive issue here uh, the North Sea Stream. But um, creating economic interdependence is, um, is, is uh, a, a very sophisticated means in order to avoid um, military escalation because you simply cannot, avoid, cannot, cannot afford military escalation. Thirdly, Europe needs a strategy for Ukraine uh, because Part of the Russian strategy is to create some sort of little empire yeah, with uh, Moldavia, Bielo, uh, Ukraine, and with the factual government in, in Moscow. The more we subtly bring what today is considered by them as satellites, bring them back to Europe, the more we gently enable Russia to integrate more and more to Europe. Um, there is no security without Russia, and there is no security against Russia. And I think what we have to keep in mind, but I say this under your control because you are the great strategist, we should not give the United States a pretext to intervene and to make what happens here between Poland and Russia, Germany and Russia, um, some sort of um, proxy battle, yeah? uh, because um, in, in Russia, the loss of an empire is still a complex in their mind, and they react whenever the United States intervene in Europe, not against Europe, but against the United States, and I think we, we are well advised to keep uh, the United States out there. No, this is not anti-American, and this requires a great defense effort on our side, mainly in the field of missile defense. But my question is clear. Let's take time and try, let's try to integrate as much as you can integrate a country like Russia. But 
you know, history is open. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, if you have. So, sir, I don't see. Let me ask you. Oh, who? Oh, okay. German question to the German professor, please, Kennel. Lieutenant Colonel Fries, um, being the German relation officer over here in Poland, I may come up with a Polish question and not with a German question, sir. Um, the Polish aim is, having heard this three weeks ago again, that Poland will participate in the Eurozone. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in two weeks, but in the future. The persons on the street are a little bit afraid because they think, first of all, the prices will rise, like they rise uh, 30 years ago also in Germany. Uh, the persons are afraid because uh, seeing, looking on this, they, they think that Poland also has to contribute not only to the positive things in the Eurozone, but also to this mess. Um, so I can understand the skepticism on the streets in Poland. You also announced in one sentence that you're... Um, your thoughts about Poland in the Eurozone are a little bit more negative. Uh, if you would have the solution, it's better for Poland to stay out of the Eurozone in the moment. Uh, my question is, could you elaborate a little bit more on this point, please, sir? Yes, with pleasure. Um, the problems of the Eurozone are rooted in the fact that the Eurozone is what we call in economic terms a suboptimal currency area. What is a optimal, what is a suboptimal currency area? An optimal currency area are the United States of America. You have a federal state. None, none of the states like California or New Hampshire can go bust without help from the federal government. You have a free labor market. If people get... Uh, lose their job in Louisiana, they are willing and able to move to uh, Southern Carolina. So you have a free movement of capital, you have a free movement of labor. And this is a compensating effect. Um, we, we don't have something comparable to that. We have differences in inflation, differences in competitiveness, even in the United States. But these differences are balanced or are compensated by movement of capital and movement of labor, whereas these movements here in Europe led to enormous repercussions because if the laborer in the harbor of Piraeus in Greece loses his job, he doesn't move automatically a fortnight later to Hamburg, but he tries to find a job around or he tries to get some money from the state. So the Eurozone, and this is the pitfall of the Eurozone, is the matter that it was from its very beginning a suboptimal currency area with totally different economies. And the bet which the European Commission made was, well, even those countries which are not competitive now, by the Euro will become competitive. That's a dream. This dream has become fiction. Greece, Spain, Italy, they don't have become more competitive. They have become less competitive through more public spending. And we cannot reverse that. So the worst thing for a catch-up economy like Portugal, like Cyprus, like Ireland, is having an overvalued uh, currency. The euro today is too expensive for Portugal. It's too expensive for Greece. It's too expensive for Spain. And they have the choice either to devaluate externally. Uh, that is impossible because the parity of the euro is fixed for all the eurozone. Or to, in, to devalue it internally, to bring costs down, to bring labor costs down, to reduce taxes, to bring down public spending. This is a crucial process if you do this within one or two years. So, if I had a word to say in Poland, and I hope to have a word to say, because I hope to come again, Prorector, I hope to be listened to, because I want Poland to be stable, there is nothing 
worse for Poland than, than to join the Eurozone today, because Poland is still in a catch-up process. And you deprive yourself of the great competitive advantages of Poland if you put on a costume with one, a costume called one size fits for all, one monetary policy for all. Interest rates everywhere the same. Uh, parity, the exchange parity every, every, everywhere the same. Poland has to continue to um, catch up with other countries like Germany and this will take place another five to ten years. And if, we have, if you continue to grow as you grow, you will achieve it. You will achieve it. Joining the Eurozone is a theoretical problem. Lieutenant Colonel, because within the next five years, this is the period where Poland most probably will not join, we will have a modification here. That system will either explode or implode, unfortunately. I hope we, we, are, we, are, we are having a, a soft landing. Yeah? But the Eurozone, when the situation is uh, mature for Poland to decide, will have fundamentally changed. So, let's wait and see and continue to grow in the meantime and keep um, a little bit uh, alert uh, um, uh, in the face of promises that the Brussels administration makes. So, thank you very much. Uh, sir, uh, one question from my side. If we are talking about the strategy, we are talking about the future, mm -hmm. not about only about the current situation. And we can create strategic scenarios mm -hmm. of situation development. Mm -hmm. Very positive. You say it's dreams, tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Very negative. Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, in which way do you estimate current economical and financial situations in the strategic perspective in the nearest one, maybe two decades? The question is, which is your realistic scenario for the European Union and for the, our future in the nearest decade, maybe two decades. Mm -hmm. Sir, what do you think about it? Yes, this is the, the strategist question. Yes, of course. <laughs> um, I think there are mainly two scenarios which we can discuss. Um, we should not forget about the fact that the situation which we find here is a situation which is extremely welcome by those in the European community or Union who have never wanted to realize the monetary union according to the Maastricht Treaty as a stability union. And you have used the crisis to fundamentally change the architecture of the European Union. And there are two models. The model we are heading for now is the mutualization of risks. Everybody is responsible for everybody. Yeah? And if the Greeks continue to badly manage the economy, then the northern countries will have to pay. So we are heading for a transfer economy. Quite clearly, some say this is unavoidable, others say we want it. But the, res the, the consequences of transfer policy are all the same. And this brings me to the second scenario. Either you preempt, as I say, you anticipate developments, and I say we need a soft landing, or you wait till the moment when transfer policy is no longer consensus, and where the people who give are no longer willing to give, because they give away too much. The European budget is about 140 billion a year. 20% of the budget is financed by Germany, Germany is a net contributor with about 10 billion euros. This is nothing compared to the sums at stake there. The European budget is a, is a clear solidarity budget. The, 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 the stronger ones give to those who need, in their own interest, to develop them, to bring them up to the same level. Here, we have a different concept. And the transfers paid here bring the strong ones, or the, the rescuers, close to being rescued themselves, which is totally illogic. Let us take a look, and I come to your scenario, 
What happens if we continue transfer policy? I give you two examples. In Belgium, a country I particularly like, you have two national communities. A very small one, a gem one, nobody speaks of them. But the Flames and the Valones. And the Flames have extremely developed their uh, economy. And due to that fact, they transfer to Valony every year for a small country of 9 million com uh, inhabitants, 10 billion euros. And the Flames don't want to pay that any longer. Because between the Flames and the Valones, it's like uh, uh, between Germans and Austrians. Yeah? <coughs> very much alike, <coughs> but very different and very keen on being different. So the problems of the country is the country is disintegrating. There are flames who want to say want to have flamey states and the Valones say want to have a Valloon state. Too much transfer leads to disintegration. I'll give you a second example. Um, Spain. In Spain you have one very or two very prosperous regions. The Basque country and Catalonia. Catalonia. Catalonia transfers to the central government. Every year. Every year. Now Catalonia is close to being rescued herself. And they do no longer want. We have a, a split away movement in Catalonia. They want to leave Spain. Imagine this. Or look at Scotland. Yeah, Scotland wants to leave the United Kingdom. So I think that development will continue, uh, fueled by those who want it, or the southern states, or those who say it's unavoidable, till the point where the populations will say, stop it. And then we have a great hold, a great moment to, to redefine um, a European design. I think the, the, and then we have to concentrate on the real subjects, because we have had in Europe a competition of currencies, and we have the internal market nevertheless. We have achieved great progress in, in uh, Europe, despite the competition of different currencies. <coughs> I can very well imagine an internal market, a free exchange of goods and services, despite different currencies. The monetary integration we have put there is anticipated. Europe was not mature for that. So... Let us wait for another chance. And then we have to focus on two fields of integration, defense integration, because this is existential, and let us continue in the strongest trigger of integration, that is to say, cultural integration. Uh, your generation is used to Europe. You take aeroplanes and you go everywhere. My daughter goes everywhere. You are the European generation. When I was your age... Well, it um, was not so difficult, not so easy to go to Poland. And even when I came back in 2001, I had to wait at the frontier. So you, you, for you, Europe is one space. You travel everywhere. And that brings a particular European consciousness, the consciousness of, of good neighborhood, on, of, of difference. Good neighborhood despite difference. Because you... You travel 200 kilometers in Europe and you meet three different cultures. Totally different. Even in Spain, if you go from the Basque country to the Catalonian countries, they speak of themselves as nations. And they speak of the, the Spanish peoples. Yeah? And look in Germany, the Bavarians and the, the people from me from Prussia or from Westphalia. So different. So this particular European consciousness is um, the best gift which will be brought about by cultural integration in the best sense of the word, not in the sense of centralization, nivelization, but experience the difference and having still the feeling of uh, belonging together, being one family of peoples. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this answer, Mr. Professor. Because of the time pressure, it was the last question in this session. Yes, of course. Dean? Can always. Professor Maciej, please ask the professor. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Professor, about the missile defense system. So do you agree? Because uh, from my point of view, missile defense at the moment is more political than operational problem, especially for European countries, including Poland. Mm -hmm. 
But is it possible to build European part of NATO missile defense having such financial problems? What do you mean about it? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, although I am of the opinion that we have to reinforce the European component of defense in general and of de missile defense in, uh, in particular, I, I'm too much a reserve soldier to believe that we can, uh, alongside to NATO, create different military operational entities. Uh, this, this is not good. We have too many European entities, chief of staff in Brussels. We double the fact. There is an organization for Western security. It's called NATO. Yeah? And everything we should do should take place in NATO, and we should improve the European component, and we should improve uh, the consultation and coordination in the European camp to be able to voice our opinion, our strategic vision, our strategic vision, towards the Americans. I'm not always sure, although I'm not at all American, anti-American, that the Americans always have um, the right strategy. Uh, they have a, if you go to Washington, they have a perception of Europe which is not always in line with the reality. I think they need our advice, yeah, and we need their means, their resources. <coughs> no question about that. But doubling instances, creating European missile defense, this is logistically, this is operationally very, very difficult. So I, I would um, um, mitigate a little bit optimism uh, in, in that field and would invite the professionals, the soldiers, to focus very much on the, on the technical problems because the technical problems are difficult enough. Are there any students who want to have questions? One student question, please. Who is the courageous one? Why are you so shy? I'm not a tiger. So, we have a one student question. <laughs> yes, of course. Good morning, Please. Professor. Uh, PhD candidate at the National Security Faculty. I have a question concerning the monetary policy. Um, uh, we have a little problem with the uh, American uh, competition and the Chinese competition. And I would like to know what is your position about um, the um, possibility of uh, countering this competition from the uh, American uh, currency and the Chinese uh, currency on the exchange markets? Mm -hmm. Well, this is again a question which uh, would deserve to be answered correctly, a whole lecture. We at present live very much in a period of currency manipulation. <coughs> um, the Chinese keep their currency relatively undervalued, slightly undervalued. <coughs> so do the, um, the Americans in order to increase export chances. Um, finally, the yen uh, is very much artificially undervalued to uh, boost uh, the Japanese economy. So this is in itself um, a problem because central banks are not there to manip manipulate their currency. They are there to manage a currency and to, uh, to make sure that the parity is the parity of the market. Uh, and that is... Uh, a new phenomenon that central banks who should serve uh, international stability are a source of instability. But this is due to the fact that central banks have been very much taken over by political implications. Mr. Bernanke follows the policy of the White House by a, po by a, uh, a quantitative easing and qualitative easing policy which is historically unique. Yeah? The biggest uh, uh, owner of American debt is the Fed, and so is the Bank of Japan, which has totally abdicated. What happens in Europe is that ECB becomes more and more political as well. I think we must resist the temptation of using central banking policy as a means of foreign trade. Second thing. <coughs> Thirdly, what can you do? Poland. I'm afraid to give you a very straight answer. Almost nothing. Because the currency area Poland represents is, I don't want to be offensive, it's insignificant. So this is one of the greatest advantages of a monetary zone and a monetary union, that you bring in critical mass. Because all of a sudden, 
the euro, and this was one of the positive effects of the eurozone, becomes a reserve money, becomes um, an alternative for the Chinese central bank. And they have to take into account what the eurozone says. So the main argument to create a monetary union and the main final argument for Poland to join a future European monetary union is to have more critical mass and to be better in bargaining. Because if you bargain today in monetary terms with the Fed, they say, hello, nice to meet you. Uh, they listen, that's all. Uh, and this was um, one of the reasons why small entities like Denmark or Greece or, or Cyprus or uh, Malta should be put into a bigger entity. So what can we do in the long run? Well, the, the topic of monetary union and of monetary integration remains very topical. But we have to fix the conditions and find the right moment. For the time being, you're the disadvantages you have of being a small, slotty area, you are, it's a, matter, statement, it's a matter of fact, and the disadvantages of joining Eurozone, well, this is incomparable. Yeah? So I would say my answer is, let's wait and see if that is accepted as an answer by you. So thank you very much. It was really last question because of the time pressure, oh. sir. So, uh, in behalf of you, mine and Rector Commandant, let me say great thanks, uh, dear Professor, for your very interesting and very open and, let me say, uh, very creating uh, paper. I hope that we will meet each other maybe in the next session in the future. I wish us. Thank you very much for your paper. Special thanks, dear Dean, Professor Marszałek. Special thanks for the staff of National Faculty, uh, because National, National Security Faculty, because of the organizing of this session. Special thanks for uh, the, our students that you are here with us. Thank you. Have a nice time for today. Sir, let me invite you for the next point of our visit. Thank you very much. Thank you to you.